Hello again, and welcome to the last class for the minor delivery and ground training. After this class, you can proceed to the knowledge check and the sweat box training to do delivery and control at minor airfields. If you wish to continue on to do the major airfield, we only have one in Orlando, that's Orlando International, then you can continue on and proceed with class seven and class eight. But those two classes are not required to get you online and going in Sweatbox with your mentor or instructor. My name is Dr. Chuck Kowaleski. I'm an S3 controller here at the VATS in Jacksonville RTAC. I'm also a mentor and a real world IFR pilot. And this is, class is gonna be on ground control. Now, before we get too far along, uh, I would like you to pause here. I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about uh, the list about ground control, airport layout, fixed wing ground movement, helicopter ground movement, sequencing, air traffic control coordination, ex what expeditious compliance is and means, abnormalities, aircraft categories, classes, runway selection, ATIS. As you can see, there's quite a bit here on this particular set of slides. Uh, at this point, the about ground control is going to be two videos that are listed in the description. I'd like you to pause and minimize this particular video and go to uh, the description and play the two videos that are listed in the description before you proceed with these slides. Thank you. And we're back. I just sat here, of course. You, you spent this time doing the videos. Let's talk about airport layouts. So in order to control taxing on the airfield, you need to know the layout of the airfield. Sort of stands to reason. And these, you're gonna be responsible for all the movement areas. The movement area is anything that is a taxiway, runway, or helipad. A non-movement area is anything that isn't, right? So that is generally the parking ramps, the FBOs, and the cargo ramps. So in VATSIM, movement in any of these non-movement areas is at the pilot's discretion. Now a sidebar here is that VATS, neither VATSIM or VETUSA or Jacksonville RTAC permit the use of ground vehicles in the simulation. So even though Microsoft Flight Simulator now has some tugs and trucks that pilots can actually drive around on the field, I've tried it, it's really hard to do. Uh, but even though they're there, they are not permitted. And so you'll undoubtedly have some users who want to uh, get in one of those things and drive all around the airfield in the non-movement areas. That is, that is not per, uh, allowed. Even though you don't control them in the VATSIM world, you do control following the rules of VATSIM. So if you have that situation, please contact a, a staff member or uh, a supervisor online with the dot wallet command uh, if you're unable to, to, con you know, to communicate with that particular user and uh, explain to them that VATSIM doesn't support ground vehicles. Moving on. So what do you actually control? Again, all the movement areas. As a ground controller, you control all the movement areas except for the runways. And in special circumstances, there will be some taxiways, typically between two active runways uh, that the tower will control. Uh, since you don't control the actual runways, you should not taxi any aircraft across a runway, active or not active, without the tower's awareness and permission. So we'll talk about that, quick explanation. November one, two, three, let's say that somebody wants to cross from the West Service area to the north here at uh, Charlie One. So they're right here. Uh, so you might tell it's the tower, you might say uh, tower ground, November one, two, three, four to cross runway one zero at Charlie One. The tower will stop and look at that, look at his airfield and see if it's safe. And he'll answer back, uh, hold short, or he'll answer back, approved. Either way, you're going to respond. So if he says hold short at uh, runway 10 at attack, runway 10 at Charlie 1, you'll read that back just like a pilot would read it back. Say hold short, and then you'll say your initials. So for me, that's DK Delta Kilo. 
Then you'll go back to the pilot and tell him to hold short. You don't need to keep going to the tower and asking for permission to cross. The tower knows he's there now. The tower will contact you when he's ready to cross. So he'll come back to you and say, ground tower, November 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, Charlie 1 at runway 10, clear to cross runway 10. And you'll answer with a read back, November 1, 2, 3, 4, clear to cross runway 10 at Charlie 1, Delta Kilo. And he'll say goodbye with his initials, Alpha, Foxtrot, whatever. And then you'll go back to the pilot and give him the clearance to taxi across. So that's how you do positive control when you're working with the tower on an active runway. So what happens first? Well, except for where we have uh, uh, ADSB on the field, or we call it ASDAX uh, on the field, the pilot has to tell you where they are. Even though you can see them in VATSIM, uh, in reality, you would have been using your own two eyes in the tower looking for them. And in reality, you would have said, where are you? So. Unless you're controlling in Orlando International, if the pilot does not tell you where they're at, ask them where they're at. So pilot will call November 1, 2, 3, 4, ready to taxi. And I have no idea where he's at. So I'll say November 1, 2, 3, 4, say position. Uh, and then he'll tell you where he's at. Now you can see him on, yes, I know you can see him on the VRC or VSTARS map, but those are not, considered Aztec fields. The only one that is is Orlando, is Orlando International. Fixed wing ground movement, aka airplanes. Uh, so when you're issuing a runway taxi instruction, follow this format. November 1, 2, 3, 4. It says location. I like to say destination. So if you're going to send a runway taxi instruction, means you're instructing them to run to taxi to a runway, right? So you set the destination first, taxi via the route. You can add uh, information to the instruction as you feel necessary. For example, if the pilot called you November 1, 2, 3, 4 at signature ready to taxi, and he does not tell you he has the ATIS information, you're actually uh, obligated to give him the altimeter. So you might say November 1, 2, 3, now, but you don't want to stop him from taxing. Remember, one of our primary things is pushing 10, right? Priority number three of the main priorities is to move traffic along. So that takes that would still take priority over the information. So November 1, 2, 3, 4, runway 8, taxi via Gulf Alpha Lima, the Jacksonville altimeter is 2999. Uh, maybe you have to tell them something slightly different. So it might be November 1, 2, 3, 4, runway 8, taxi via Gulf Alpha Lima, use caution 737 800, taxiing right to left on Alpha. So that would be an example of telling them you know, as they come out of Gulf and go to Alpha. There's going to be a 737 crossing in front of them. Don't get run over. And as you know, it's often the case that the props don't need two miles of runway in order to take off. So when that's the case, you can give them an instruction to an intersection. I usually, if I'm on ground, I usually check with tower to make sure that's not going to screw anything up because some of these intersections uh, happen to be where uh, the, the the commercial just might want to turn off at, and so the tower might not want me to send somebody there for a departure. So I usually just check with them uh, at least once uh, to make sure that's okay. Uh, so no, November 1, 2, 3, 4, runway 8 at Papa. In this case, I'm sorry, runway 1, 4 at Papa. And then you have to tell them how many feet remaining. So there's a really easy way to do that in uh, VRC. Just double click at the intersection and then drag your mouse to the departure end of the, the where they're going to take off, that is, the direction they're flying, to the departure end of the runway, and it'll give you the distance in miles. And knowing that miles is close to 5,000 feet, you can do a quick estimate based on the value and give them the approximate feet remaining. For uh, some of the airfields, like 
or lambda, we've actually written that out in the SOP so that you know exactly what those, those distances are. But in the other ones, you can estimate it. And I mean, if you have a, a runway that's 5,000 feet remaining for a Cessna 172, that's still way more runway than a Cessna 172 needs. They, they should need at more than 3,000, 3,500 feet. So it's plenty of extra distance. Uh, so it's okay to give them an intersection departure, and in fact, it improves the uh, movement of traffic when you do so. So here's a couple of taxi instruction explanations. Uh, so FedEx 31, Jacksonville Ground FedEx 3162 is rated taxi with, and it doesn't matter how they say it, they can say with information, they can say with Oscar, they can say with Yatis, they can say with current weather. It does not matter how they say it, as long as they acknowledge they got it. Uh, and that's true in the World War II. So FedEx 3162 Jacksonville ground, safe position. Again, you're in an area that doesn't have ground radar, so you have to ask them. FedEx 3162, short of taxiway Sierra. And then Jacksonville ground, FedEx 3162. Runway 14, destination, taxi via Sierra, November, Lima. Now, sometimes you're going to do this via text as well. So, uh, especially when I was starting out as a ground controller, uh, I knew that there were only a couple routes out to a runway uh, on Jacksonville and the other small fields. So I actually wrote it out on a little uh, notepad screen and left it up in front of me so that I could rapidly and easily uh, look at it, check it, and, and read it off to them. And once I got comfortable with the phraseology, I didn't have to do that anymore after a couple of weeks. And so he'll read it back to you. FedEx 3162, he'll read back. Runway 14, Taxi Vice Sierra, November Lima, FedEx 3162. If they read it back incorrectly, then you'll say, then you'll call them back. FedEx 3162, Taxi instructions incorrect, and then you'll repeat them. Runway 14, taxi by Sierra November Lima, and expect them to read back correctly. Uh, and we'll see if there are any other special considerations here before I give you more. Example number two Jacksonville Ground, JetBlue 4892, radio taxi short of taxiway hotel. So he told you right where he's at, but he didn't give you the information. JetBlue 4892, runway 14, taxi via Hotel Alpha Lima, the Jacksonville altimeter is 29 or 9 or 2. Runway 14, taxi via Hotel Alpha Lima, JetBlue 4892. He does not need to read back the altimeter. You have to give it to him, but he doesn't have to read it back. <clears throat> That's also true in the air, although virtually everyone does read it back in the air. Uh, here's a third example. Jacksonville Ground, American 45, 456, ready to taxi short of taxiway Romeo. Again, he didn't give us the information. When they do give me the information, I usually say thank you. So had he said, ready to taxi short of Romeo with Oscar, I will typically say, American 456, thank you for Oscar. And I would read it off to him. Uh, and that, I do that because everybody else listening on the radio realizes that that's a good thing, and hopefully they'll start getting good habits. American 456, Jacksonville Ground, Runway 14, Taxi via Romeo, November Lima. Caution the Boeing 747 on Taxiway November. I will often say passing from your left to right, but it doesn't have to say that. The Jacksonville Timber 299 or 2. And he'll read it back. Runway 14, taxi via Romeo, November, Lima. We'll look for the Boeing 747, American 456. Uh, does he have to read back that he's looking? No, he does not, but it's nice when they do. I'm sorry, I, uh, I'm sorry let me uh, go back to that. I am wrong. Uh, if you issue a caution, they must, re they must reply back with the caution. So he has to say... Look, uh, we'll look for the Boeing 747. If he doesn't, just repeat to, to him, American 456, caution, Boeing 747, taxiway in November. That'll usually prompt them to read it back to you. So, whole short instructions and cautions, got to read back. 
number four, Jacksonville Ground, American 456, ready to taxi short of Romeo, with information Alpha. I will say, American 456, Jacksonville Ground, thank you for Alpha. Runway 14 at Papa, 4,200 4, feet remaining, taxi via Romeo, November, Papa. And that's for giving him an intersect departure. Normally, commercial aircraft do not get intersection departures, but you can do it. If there's enough space and they accept it, you can do it. Runway 14 Papa, taxi via Romeo, November, Papa, American 456. Uh, so a hold short instruction means that the pilot should should stop short of the line that you see on the picture to the right. Now, quick question. Which side of that line does the aircraft stop on? If you said they stop on the side with the solid yellow lines, you would be correct. This indicator says to anybody who sees it that you, unless told otherwise, you should cross the dotted yellow line and stop so your aircraft is clear of the solid yellow line. And you will typically see this at the turnoff taxiways of runways. If they are coming to the runway, this is a stop sign that says, do not cross the double yellow line until you are told to do so. And this is why you don't really have to tell someone to hold short of runway 14 when they're taxiing to the runway because this line on the runway is telling them the same thing. Similarly, this line is telling the arriving aircraft who came off the runway onto this taxiway after you cross the double yellow, the dotted double yellow lines, you must stop with your tail of your plane clear of the solid yellow lines. So when issuing a whole short instruction, you need, you need to use the following format. November 1234, Runway 14, taxi via Gulf Alpha Lima, hold short of Alpha. And then they will read it back. And remember, they're required to read back hold short instructions. So if they don't, give it to them again. But they will say, they will respond and tell you, and they will answer with hold short of whatever, Alpha. After they're clear to cross, usually the you either clear them because the other traffic is, is no longer a factor, uh, or if you held them because the tower told you to, the tower will let you release them to cross, and you will say, November 1, 2, 3, 4, continue. In this case, November 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, cross whatever that hold short point is. Uh, and then I usually add another phrase that's in the 7110, which is continue taxi. Uh, do not issue multiple hold short instructions. That confuses everybody. So don't tell them to taxi to runway 14 via Gulf Alpha Lima. Hold short Alpha, hold short Lima. Do not do that. Give them the hold short Alpha if you need to. Then once you clear them to continue on Alpha, and you, if you need it again, give them the hold short Lima after that. But don't do them all. Don't do them at the same time. So here we have an aircraft in the International Terminal at Charleston, Delta 495, ready to taxi with current weather. Delta 495, Charleston ground safe position. Delta 495, short taxiway Delta or Alpha, Delta 495. And you'll say Jack's uh, Delta 495, runway 21, which is way over here. Runway 21, taxi via Alpha. Hold short runway 33. Three. Now he must read back hold short instructions. Runway 21 taxi via alpha. Hold short runway 33. Three. Again, if he fail, if he just says taxi via alpha and doesn't give you the hold short read back, you have to reissue it. And you have to say Delta 495, hold short runway 33 three on alpha. And they have to read it back. So in this case, once, once they, the tower says they can cross, you've done your transaction with the tower. You, you know, you've said uh, uh, tower ground, tower answers. You say Delta 495 uh, cross runway 33 at Alpha. 
And once the tower comes back and says, approved, Alpha Foxtrot, you'll say Delta Kilo, you'll go back on the frequency, and you will say Delta 495 cross runway 33. You could be very specific and say cross runway 33 at Alpha. <clears throat> uh, you don't have to because he's actually holding short Alpha. And then he'll read back cross runway 33 and he'll continue on his way. You do not need to give him the rest of the taxiway instructions because you already gave it to him. So a progressive taxi is precise taxi instructions given to a pilot unfamiliar with the airport. Or in our world, just about every Vatsim pilot who doesn't bother to open their charts. Uh, <clears throat> so these are very resource intensive. And so we don't typically like to do them. And we won't do them unless the pilot requests. So, And when they do, that means you have to follow them on the map or visually if you're using some sort of tower view. And as they come up to each turn, you have to tell them, November 1, 2, 3, 4, turn left next taxiway. November 1, 2, 3, 4, hold short of the next taxiway. Or November 1, 2, 3, 4, continue on taxiway alpha. Uh, and that becomes tedious, and it, dire it directs your attention away from the other things you got to do. So we don't normally do it unless they ask for it. Uh, I have done it or offered it to pilots who were hopelessly lost on the field and, and taxiing all over the place. And basically, I they, they were unpredictable. I didn't know where they were going to end up next. So I gave I offered them progressive instructions, mostly for my benefit, so I could get them back into the into the queue. <clears throat> There are occasions that you'll have conflicts and you'll need to give instructions. So the simplest one and the easiest one to do, especially if you haven't had time to figure out how you're going to organize this, is just hold position. That's a great taxi instruction. When you're not sure and you need to figure it out, just stop the airplane. So uh, Delta 495, hold position. They will come to a stop. Now it gives you time to figure out what happened and how you're going to reroute the other aircraft to fix it. Uh, but then you might, after looking at that, decide uh, Delta 495, continue taxi to runway 14, maybe via uh, Gulf Bravo Hotel, Alpha Lima. So maybe you rerouted them around uh, somebody who had stopped or, or who was having trouble. <clears throat> but the whole position is a great one to know. You can use it anytime you want to, to buy yourself a few seconds to look at the taxiways and decide where you want people to go. It certainly beats having people coming nose to nose on the same taxiway with nowhere to go around. You can also use this to simplify things. So if you've got a, a club flying out, you can say uh, Delta 493, runway 14, taxi via uh, you know, Hotel Alpha Lima. And then for the next one, Delta 495, the one that's following, you can say Delta 495, Runway 14, follow the Delta, follow the 737-800, follow company aircraft on Taxiway Hotel. You don't have to get, and that way you know that he's going to, they're just going to do a conga line down to the end of the runway. Uh, helicopter ground movement. So helicopters are sort of fun. They're, they're available in all the sims and people do like to fly them, particularly in the Orlando area where there's lots to see in the simulated environment. So they don't taxi quite the same as fixed wing, but if you think about it, in most cases they do. So a surface taxi is a helicopter with wheels. And that's easy. It's the same as a fixed wing aircraft. You give them the same instructions and uh, and, and how to use them. Uh, a hover taxi is a low and slow. They're going to stay in ground effect, and they're not going to go any faster than a fixed wing does, which is 20 knots. So that's essentially a hover taxi is the same as a surface taxi, except they've got to get above the ground because they don't have wheels. An air taxi is actually the preferred method for helicopters. And <clears throat> because it gets them around the airport quickly and out of your way and they can fly uh, at or below 50 feet there are certain conditions with SOPs at certain airports where they bump it up to 100 feet we don't have any of those in Florida so everybody here is 50 feet where they do there's an SOP that tells you that <clears throat> so if you visit another field you might see an SOP that says they can go above 50 feet 
but generally uh, no. So they can fly uh, greater than 20 knots and typically they're not going to go much more than uh, 50 knots and I've, I've never seen them do 100 knots uh, but typically they'll do uh, up to 50 knots <coughs> as they go and they don't need to follow the taxiways. So a surface taxi and a hover taxi is going to follow the taxiways and do the same things that a fixed wing a plane will do. An air taxi, because they're higher, they can go direct to where they need to go. Uh, the caveat to that is you can't fly them over other fixed wing airplanes. So uh, there are some videos that you want to see at the end of this that shows you what a hover taxi is and what a uh, air taxi is. Uh, that's neither that you see on this screen. Uh, but a hover taxi is simple. Call sign, instead of saying taxi, you say hover taxi to runway 14 via Gulf of Lima. Uh, it's just the same as a fixed wing taxi. The air taxi, uh, you, can, you can do the routing if you want, but most of the time you just say direct. So uh, you, you say uh, helicopter 101, air taxi, uh, direct to runway 14 or direct to the helicopter maintenance area, whatever they're going to. Uh, you can have them remain at or below an altitude. Uh, again, 50 feet is implied, uh, so you really typically don't need to do that. Uh, but you also need to remember that you still give them the same cautionary advisory you give to any other aircraft. So you might say, caution, Boeing 737 taxiing on runway alpha just like you would any fixed wing, because you don't want them to fly into it. You want them to see that they're there. You, if you're at certain airfields, you might say caution uh, for a crane. In the real world, they'll also say caution crane up to 200 feet west of the tower or wherever it's located. Now that information is available in the in the aircraft uh, or sorry, in the airfield directory. It's also available on NOTAMS. The pilot ought to know that. Uh, let's go about ground sequencing. Uh, this is uh, the line every time I try to go to Wawa's to get gas. Uh, we want to reduce these types of delays. Pilots get, uh, you know, a little bit intense about waiting. So these are three rules. Uh, when possible, put the bigger aircraft before the smaller aircraft. This was not intuitive to me. I thought I'd want the smaller aircraft out in front so they didn't have to worry about wake turbulence. But in fact, the bigger aircraft are so much faster that the wake turbulence delay is is uh, dwarfed by the delays you'd have if you put a very slow taxiing aircraft in front of a big aircraft. So uh, put the big aircraft first and don't worry about the wake turbulence. Uh, you can sequence aircraft and what that means is uh, we'll talk about if you have aircraft that are all going out on the same departure or maybe two different departures if you can have somebody going on perhaps somebody's going on the irony departure and somebody's going on the xbox departure which are in two different directions uh, if you sequence them irony xbox irony xbox it'll make it easier for the tower controller to get them out because uh, they're going they're going to be on a diverging heading and they can send them right out uh, don't sequence aircraft with the same route together if you can help it. So try not to put uh, all of the Arnies in a row. Now you might do a trick like putting some on uh, runway eight and some on runway one four. Uh, and sometimes there's no way around it. Sometimes the only thing that every single one of them are going out on the same route. Typical, that's typical of a Vatson club. Uh, there's nothing you can do if that's the case. Uh, they're just gonna have to wait in line uh, to take off. And it's not really, it's not your fault. Uh, but if you can, think about where their departure gates are or their departure procedures and try to mix them up. Coordinating with ATC. We talked about this before, uh, so I'll go through it briefly. Uh, ground controllers, so you say your name last. So you call, the, you call them first and then say your name. The reason for that is it gives them time to alert to the fact you called their name. And then now they're listening and they hear who called them. Uh, if you say ground tower and they alert, they didn't hear the ground part. They didn't know it was you. So tower ground. Oh, tower, go ahead. 
and it's ground November 1234 permission to cross uh, runway 14 at, at Alpha. Approved Alpha Foxtrot. Roger, Delta Kilo. It's very simple. Uh, and you'll do this in Discord. Uh, on some of the RTX, they use TeamSpeak. Most of them are using Discord now. Uh, but And that's why you'll notice in Discord we have different uh, chat channels. So you can get into the one that's appropriate to your cab. Expeditious compliance. Uh, what this means is we need them to do what we asked them to do right now. So you would only use the word immediately when failure to do so is going to cause some type of problem like a collision or, or two of them ending up nose to nose. So perhaps you looked at the taxiways and realized that they're, they have two aircraft going toward each other on the same taxiway and there's only one, let's say they're both coming at each other Gulf and the only option is for one of them to turn on to, on to let's say they're on Alpha and the only option is to turn on to Gulf. Uh, and have one of them go on to Golf and then over to Bravo in order to stay out of the way. So you might look at that and go, oh, EGADs. No, so now what you can also do is, for both aircraft, uh, you can tell them the whole position, right? That'll get you, buy you time right away. Uh, but, you, but you could also say, November 3, 4, 5, 6, immediately turn left on Golf. Uh, the problem with that, for me, is that it doesn't give them enough time to react. That's why I like to say November 3, 4, 5, 6, hold position. I might have to say hold position immediately. November 1, 2, 3, 4, hold position. And then bring them both to a stop. And then I have to figure out which one's going to go where, and I tell them where to go. But you can use the word immediately to have them do something uh, right away. Uh, without delay is when you simply want them to be prompt about it. So uh, if I have, let's say I have a commercial aircraft coming off the gate, but I have a Cessna coming off of the FBO, and I want to get the commercial aircraft out before the Cessna, uh, I would tell, uh, you know, Delta 495, without delay, runway 14, taxi via hotel off of Lima. Meaning I don't want them to sit on the gate and play around. I want them to get rolling. Uh, and then hopefully that'll get them out before the Cessna. Now, if they can't do that or they don't comply, I can still tell the Cessna, November 1234, uh, hold short of hotel and they would stop and let the commercial aircraft come out. So there's lots of ways to, to make the taxiways work for you. Uh, abnormalities, uh, you pretty much won't see these. They're allowed to declare in-flight emergencies when under air traffic control. Uh, the Some of the simulators, particularly X-Plane, will adequately and appropriately simulate an aircraft emergency. Uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator will simulate them. They're not quite as accurate, and sometimes they do it a little too often. Uh, but both of the simulators will, will surprise the pilot with some type of emergency. <clears throat> now, if, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if, if you can handle it and you can run the emergency, it's fun for the pilot, it's fun for you, it's good experience, by all means, go right ahead. But if things are really busy, we're in the middle of an event, uh, or you simply can't do it, then uh, just ask the pilot to disconnect and correct the problem. Uh, now, and if they tell you they're declaring an emergency because their their flight simulator is going wacko and they're not following you know, controller instructions for their USB controllers, that's not a real emergency. Uh, I'll just tell them to go ahead and disconnect, fix the problem, and come on back on. Uh, you cannot do anything that's they can't do anything that's considered unlawful like they can't simulate a hijacking uh, they can't simulate <clears throat> that they're going to fly into buildings they can't do things that are unlawful right so they can uh, occasionally there, there's no reason for anybody to declare a mayday online uh, I have not heard anybody do it they can uh, call pan 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 again I've never that's the international uh, mayday call I've never seen or heard anyone do that and uh, as I said, uh, normally uh, they shouldn't be squawking 7700. If they do, you have a choice, and it's okay to tell them to disconnect. If you want to uh, support it, uh, I had one guy actually who was training me as a tower controller, and he simulated emergency on takeoff, which was cool for me. And he was just out there flying around. 
<clears throat> so I didn't tell him to disconnect. I could have, but uh, he crashed anyway. Aircraft categories and classes. So we'll talk about heavy and supers. So you can look at the 7110 or you can look at any of the charts we have available and see what these are. Uh, the heavy aircraft in VRC and VATSIM, they will have heavy with an H and super with a J, and they will actually be in front of the call sign on the uh, flight plan. In, in their SIM brief, it may be in the back, but when you look at it on the flight plan, it'll actually be a prefix. Why do we care? Because these guys create a whole lot more turbulence and they can affect small aircraft. <clears throat> we'll talk a lot more about them when we talk about tower control. Runway selection and ATIS. This is pretty straightforward. I think most of you know it. Uh, you're typically going to use the runway that has the greatest amount of, air, of wind going toward the airplane, right? They take off into the wind. Uh, so when you're selecting the runway, select the runway that has the greatest amount of wind. And if you're not familiar with the sine and cosine of an angle and the value, uh, do a quick little math review to see how you can use the sine and cosine of an angle. Uh, and then you, and that angle and the runway will, of the comparison will tell you. Uh, so a, a good example, if the wind is coming out of uh, 240, and people are taking off at 210, that's a 30 degree angle, right? Well, if you take the cosine of the 30 degree angle and multiply it by the wind, you will get what's called the crosswind component, how much that wind is crossing the airplane. And if you do the sine of that angle times the wind, you will get how much of the wind is actually going in front into the airplane. Similarly, if it was, uh, if the wind was coming out here, at uh, let's say uh, 08, what's that? 08, 08, 08, I think. Uh, then you're looking at a 50 degree angle and you would get a tailwind. <clears throat> so the example below shows how to select an active runway and it's only 30, oh, 30 seconds of advertising. Two minutes. Okay, we're not going to do it because uh, I'll put it in the diagram and you, or into the definition and you can uh, watch it at the end of this uh, slide deck. You are permitted to provide ATIS when the tower is offline. Uh, most of the ATIS, on our, the program is called V-ATIS. Uh, it's available for download and all the profiles are in our Jacksonville uh, folders on the website. So you can download all the profiles that preload what the ATIS should be for any airport. And we have every airport in our RTAC in that profile set. Uh, so you'll simply select the profile. Uh, you'll update the ATIS information. I frequently use a, uh, a dATIS.io, which is a website that provides uh, the web pages of what the current digital ATIS are, are showing. Uh, I'll often use that as my basis for my ATIS information. Uh, and I'll also use that to select the ATIS information letter. I'll select the same one they're currently using. Uh, but all this information will be provided on the ATIS. The uh, observation time, weather, active runway, expected approaches, uh, and frequency to contact, and all that stuff is on the ATIS. Uh, <clears throat> you don't need to do everything that's on the NOTAM on the ATIS. You should only do the stuff that's applicable to VATSIM. For example, if a runway is closed and you're going to simulate the closed runway, you should put that on the ATIS. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a little small taxiway in and out of a gate, we're typically not going to simulate that in VATSIM, so you don't need to put that in the ATIS. Uh, try to limit the ATIS to only a few lines, uh, particularly on the NOTAMs. You don't need to make it real long and exhaustive because if you do, the pilots have trouble reading it in the simulation. Finally, that's the end of class six. And after you've completed these six classes, uh, if you understand the information, please get with your instructor and mentor to do a knowledge check and get on with your uh, online 
hands-on uh, sweat box training so you can get out there and start controlling with us here in the RTAC. Look forward to seeing you on the air. Thank you very much.